Good morning, and it's great to see everyone. We're gonna get started in just a few moments. Well, welcome everyone. It is great to see all of you. Uh, I'm Mark Holiday. I think I know pretty much, if not everyone, uh, who's in attendance today. But just in case, I'm Mark Holiday, Senior Leadership Specialist uh, with the University of Delaware, Delaware Academy for School Leadership. And this is the launch of our Delaware Superintendent Study Council. Uh, this is a partnership. For those don't, who don't know, this is a partnership between the governor's office, the Department of Education, the University of Delaware, Delaware Academy for School Leadership, and our public schools, that's you. Um, the intent of the study council is to provide timely, relevant content to you, foster collective learning, and promote collaboration so that you can lead with purpose. And that is exactly what today's session is all about. So that you can probably see that there are a number of people uh, joining us today from outside um, the public schools. And um, it would be appropriate at this point to have our Secretary of Education, Susan Bunting, welcome all of you and share a few words. Great to see you, Secretary Bunting. Thank you, Mark. And as secretary, I'm truly honored to welcome you to this first class, this first opportunity for the Superintendent Study Council. Um, I, I believe you are extremely fortunate to have such an invaluable opportunity to join your peers in this exciting venture. To be very candid, I wish I could have had such an opportunity when I was a chief. Modeled after existing uh, very effective programs across the region and across the nation, uh, the Study Council provides a platform for you for collaboration on the most pressing issues that you as school leaders are going to face. The program designers will be bringing in experts to share research that uh, you leaders will transform into action. And during your monthly meetings, these researchers, your colleagues and practitioners will address the latest and the hottest issues in education and they'll stimulate thought provoking solution producing discussions. Your opportunities to engage in site visits to observe best practice in action will be both mind changing and style altering. In addition, you will have the opportunity to further grow as a learning leader by way of the opportunities to connect with national organizations such as AASAs, the School Superintendent Association and the New York City Leadership Academy which I predict will be a totally mind-boggling chance to hone your executive skills and, and learn with your colleagues. Those colleagues are gonna be able to share your talents and tasks, and they can easily uh, relate to your demands. Um, these are collaborative ways to solve your problems. Uh, I really think that this is something you should highly prize, and uh, I think it's an awful, it's an, uh, just an inopportune uh, gift that is being offered to you. In all seriousness, uh, I really think that at this point in your careers to be a part of this leadership network is something that is uh, truly inspiring and exciting. They're going to craft their activities to meet your very specific needs. Uh, the council will not only feature, um, but they will foster collective learning and they're gonna strengthen your individual abilities, whatever they might be, to lead and to act 
as Mark said, with purpose and with promise. I have to confess, I'm really envious. Acknowledging your promising participation in this group uh, will inspire your growth opportunities. And um, I can't resist offering you a few words of advice. First, um, I want you to enjoy the experience, um, enjoy the people that you're working with. Secondly, I hope that you are able to learn from your peers, not only now, but during, the, uh, the, during these sessions, but also throughout the remaining years of your careers. Your cohort members will prove to be invaluable allies. I want you to learn from the masters as well, both those of today and those who have um, paved the way for leaders throughout the years. Uh, one of my go-tos, and I've mentioned this before, is Abe Lincoln. What I learned from Philip's book entitled Leadership Daily Influences My Work. Known for his admirable character, Lincoln professed that honesty and integrity are the best policies. And I too not only highly prize honesty and integrity, but will share with my team, the first advice I give them is that what I expect from them on a daily basis is honesty and integrity. And if we have those two qualities, we can together solve anything else that we face. So I strongly suspect that your honesty and integrity were integral to your selection and your participation in this superintendent study council cohort. During my four years as secretary of education, I have been blessed to work with educators of your caliber. For more than a decade as a fellow superintendent, I was privileged to realize that I could call on you. I could celebrate, I could commiserate, I could collaborate and coordinate efforts. I have watched several of you grow as administrators into the positions that you now hold. I value what each of you has to offer. I know from experience how demanding your jobs are, particularly under the current circumstances. Together, we've been able to accomplish much despite the challenge. Consequently, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to each of you for the time that you will invest in this program. The return on your investment will be exponential for your efforts will ultimately translate into unprecedented benefits for the students, the staff and the stakeholders with whom you have the privilege to interact and the school systems that you oversee. During the governor's inaugural presentation in January, he referenced looking forward with hope and optimism with your qualities and attributes which will be amplified by way of your participation in the Superintendent Study Council experience. I'm looking forward to the future for I envision that you are the embodiment of hope and optimism that can and will lead Delaware schools to unparalleled heights. I thank you for all you do and I thank you for being you. Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Bunting. And there are a few others um, who are here today who I wanna recognize and thank for uh, the work that they've been doing behind the scenes and supporting this. Um, one on our side, working with our team uh, is Jackie Wilson. This is something that Jackie has been both formally and informally talking about for uh, many years, a superintendent study council, and she has been uh, pivotal in making this happen. So much thanks to Jackie Wilson and also to Tracy Hudson and Carolyn Hammersmith who work with Dazzle who have been so involved in pulling uh, all of this together. And I also wanna recognize Michael Saylor uh, who works with the Department of Education. Michael uh, has been uh, rolling up his sleeves doing the uh, hard work and heavy lifting to make all of this happen. And um, uh, has been also pivotal uh, with, with the Governor's Institute. So thank you, Michael, for everything that you've done and, and for championing the idea of a superintendent's study council. And then I would be remiss not to mention the governor. Governor Carney has been uh, you know, incredibly supportive of this, the conversations we've had with him. This is what he envisions in terms of supporting our district and school leaders. So much thanks to him. <clears throat> I also want to recognize a superintendent from outside of Delaware who is joining us today, Superintendent Chris Marchese from Avon Grove. Uh, Chris, thank you for uh, giving uh, us your team today. Uh, there is a lot going on in Avon Grove and across the state, especially in Newcastle and Kent counties. A number of you are closed or uh, you're all virtual today. 
or you're dealing with two hour delays and such. And so the fact that, uh, you know, Chris has given us his team and that all of you are joining us means an, an awful lot to us. Um, I believe you're here because you know that the future of virtual teaching uh, is critically important. What we're hearing out in the news, in fact, there was an article in the paper about it today, is that things have to change as we get back to the new normal in regard to virtual teaching. And that's easy to say and talk about, but I think as school leaders, district leaders, we all know it's much, much harder to do. Well, we have a district that has been doing some great work in this area and leading that work in Avon Grove is gonna be our lead facilitator today, Nikki Harvey. Nikki is currently the director of K-12 teaching and learning in Avon Grove. Prior to that, she was the director of ed leadership in the Chester County Intermediate Unit. And prior to that, she did work and led schools, uh, cyber schools in and around the Philadelphia area. She's been a pleasure to work with as well. And I very much look forward to Avon Grove's presentation today. Nikki. Thank you so much, Mark. Good morning, everyone. It really is an honor to be here with you this morning. Um, Mark highlighted some aspects of my journey in education. Um, I have to say that the thing I am most proud of is being an Avon Grove alumni. So it truly is an honor for me to be able to serve in the community that raised me and to be able to give back there. Thank you for sharing our slides this morning, Dr. Koch. He's gonna be our driver. Uh, so please be patient with us as we say next slide probably too many times, but we will do our best to navigate smoothly this morning. As I mentioned, Avon Grove is so honored to be with you this morning. Uh, study councils are alive and well in our area. The Avon Grove team members have had an opportunity to participate in study councils through the University of Pennsylvania, through the Delaware Valley Consortium for Equity and Excellence in Education, and a study council that is called the Suburban Study Council, um, that's Southern Chester County, um, the Southern part of Pennsylvania, and some areas of New Jersey and Delaware um, made up of superintendents and their cabinet members. So we really do value everything that study councils have to offer. We appreciate the opportunity to hear about the experiences of others. And you will hear a lot from us this morning about our story and our experiences um, as we try to maintain a continuity of education during the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that study councils are important because the members get to share their experience as well. So throughout our time together this morning, we hope to learn just as much from you as you learn from us. We also appreciate being able to learn about evidence-based approaches that are proven to work in education. So you will hear from us today about a coherence framework from Fullen and Quinn that has been proven successful, and we hope to continue to build and implement that in Avangrove and perhaps give you some ideas in your districts. And lastly, we appreciate study councils for the opportunity to engage in forward thinking and problem solving together. We all have an opportunity now to make a crucial decision in terms of what's next for education. As Mark mentioned, where do we go from here? Where do we go with virtual learning? It obviously isn't going away. So a big part of our time together today, we'll be talking about the future of education as well. The pandemic started about 344 days ago, in case anyone is, is counting. Um, our session today will be about 150 minutes long. Yet among those 344 days, we have spent almost 500,000 minutes trying to navigate education in this pandemic. So what you're gonna hear from us today is just a small sample of everything that we've done along the way to try to deliver the best possible services for our Avon Grove learners. Next slide, Dr. Koch. So to start off this morning, we are gonna do some introductions via chat message. Hopefully you have your guided notes to use during our session today. We will put them in the chat now in case you need to refer to them. Um, you're welcome to have them up electronically. And of course, 
uh, many of you probably printed them out as well. So for our warm up and introductions, please take a moment to rename yourself. If you haven't done that already, uh, you can hover over the three dots in the top right corner of your screen and add your district's initials there. It will help with breakout rooms and, and for us to be able to uh, move into those quickly this morning. And then take a few minutes and introduce yourself in the chat by sharing your name, your role, your district, and if you had to describe 2020 in six words or less, what might you say about it? So I'm going to pause, give everyone a minute to go ahead and do some introductions via the chat message. Thank you for everyone for uh, putting those introductions in there. We see some great comments for the six words or less. Every day is a new day. Grace, grit, growth, absolutely. A roller coaster ride of opportunities. Way to focus on the positive. That's awesome. Busy, rewarding, tiring, and energizing. Absolutely as well. These are great. Please keep them coming. And Dr. Koch, we can move forward with the next slide. So students were asked what they had to say about lessons learned from 2020. We know that kids say the darndest things and we see that right here. Daytime pajamas make great school att attire. If I learned one thing, masks. I love and hate my family. Some of us might be able to relate to that after working from home for so long. So these are, these are great comments here from students about 2020. Next slide, Dr. Koch. Dr. Marchese, I'm gonna turn it over to you to do uh, an introduction this morning for our team. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully most of you made your snow calls last night so you didn't have to get up super early this morning. Um, but we, we do wanna say thank you for the opportunity to uh, share our work in Avangrove with all of you today. Um, we have gone through quite a journey over the last 11 months uh, in, the ter in terms of turning our district to a virtual district in March of last year and then maintaining that and, and strengthening that on that work as we started the uh, 2021 school year. Um, study councils, um, uh, as Mark had mentioned in his statements and, and others this morning, uh, they're really, really important in terms of continuing professional growth. Uh, I am uh, the president of the Suburban Study Council, which represents the uh, county school districts of Chester and Delaware County. And we've been doing this for, for many, many years, coming together on a monthly basis and, and learning from one another. So it's great that all of you have that network that you're establishing here in the state of Delaware. And uh, certainly we are uh, really pleased and proud to, to be part of uh, your work today. Uh, the team that I'll introduce this morning that will lead us through our program is a phenomenal team of educators. We really have built um, a, a phenomenal team uh, here in Avangrove. And um, really the success of the program um, is really based on all of their, their input and their work uh, to make it what it is today. Uh, they are certainly uh, strong leaders in education in the Southeastern region of Pennsylvania um, and uh, really have uh, garnered a lot of respect um, uh, from, from area colleagues, but most importantly, our community and our faculty and staff. Um, we have phenomenal teachers in our school district who have really 
been um, uh, thrusted into a, a, a situation that a lot of them were not prepared for. Uh, and we walked the process with them side to side to make sure that they were comfortable in uh, shifting uh, the teaching and learning environment from a um, face-to-face -face environment to a virtual environment. I think we have made significant strides um, with our faculty and staff in, in terms of delivering services to students during the pandemic uh, by means of, um, of, of virtual learning. So uh, with that being said, I'd like to introduce our team. Um, along with us this morning is Dr. Michael Snubkowski. He's our assistant superintendent. Uh, as you know, you've already met Nikki, Dr. Nikki Harvey, our director of teaching and learning. Uh, Mr. Sean Burns is our director of pupil services. And Dr. Jason Koch is our director of technology. Uh, they are the core members of my cabinet uh, and uh, really are, are the think tank for Avon Grove School District. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and we were always at your disposal. So even after today's program, uh, if you want to reach out uh, to us uh, to, to pick our brains further, we are certainly available uh, to uh, support you in your own journeys uh, in your own school district. So thank you again. Thank you and good morning. Uh, this is certainly very exciting for me as a, as a graduate of the University of Delaware and their doctoral program, uh, having an opportunity to, to work not only through the University of Delaware, but also um, with superintendents um, from the state of Delaware. Um, in Avon Grove School District, one of the things that we recognize and, and also that I'm sure you recognize is that the narrative and the information that we share with our communities uh, is really important to be understood very deeply by the community, as well as those of us who are on the team in attempting to establish our direction moving forward. I'm very appreciative that the words purpose um, were used earlier today in describing the role of the, the study council, as well as the process that we go through in education to support every learner in our school district, every teacher in our school district and our overall school communities. Uh, our time together today is really going to be spent around the purpose that Avon Grove utilized um, throughout the uh, initial stages of the pandemic and then also as we prepared for the 2021 school year, as well as our look forward. Um, we continue to, to say to ourselves and we're saying to our teachers, in August, we're not expecting to come back. Um, in August, we are moving forward and we are very excited for the learning that we're going to engage in today with you and continue to bring to our school district in support of our community. When we look at our program today, we're, we're very excited to, to share with you um, how we work through a best faith effort, how we created a growth mindset. And certainly that growth mindset was something that was critical in the work that happened in Avon Grove School District and recognizing the work that needed to be done um, was monumental. Um, but everyone on the team certainly committed to that through their efforts. Um, we are very invested in the coherence framework um, it was already referenced by Dr. Harvey, and we'll be speaking to it more um, shortly, um, but the four drivers of the coherence framework, in retrospect, were the drivers that we used to develop a successful program for the 2021 academic school year. Uh, our work, your work, um, and this work for our future is how we expect to build our system for education in, in Avon Grove and continuing to look forward as to how we will be supporting our community and helping our students now who have had an unbelievable experience continue to grow and develop and receive the support that they need to be successful in the future. We want to continue to engage in the future low education. We recognized that about a year ago, as Dr. Harvey said, 344 days ago, we were anticipating change, but I don't think any of us could have anticipated what would have happened, not only through the spring of last year, but through the constant change that we've all experienced during what was 2020 and now into 2021. Um, but having learned much through this experience and having had an opportunity to build and grow our team, as well as expand our team throughout our district, um, we are actually very excited for what the future of education holds, not just for Avon Grove, but really for all students and all school districts. While we work together today, we're going to be thinking about how we're going to interact and collaborate with each other. So we certainly want to embrace the growth mindset that will allow us to be successful and learn from each other. Um, we know that the smartest person in the room is the room. So we want to respect and engage with the thinking that others are bringing to today's session as well. Um, we're going to do our best to maintain the schedule that we've developed so that we can maximize our time with you, but also be respectful of the work that you have to do um, as a team and, and certainly want to be able to support that work. 
Um, we value the perspectives by recognizing our differences. Um, and those differences, whether it be in our approach, whether it be in our learning styles or the positions that we occupy, those are the things that bring the greatest amount of variability to our work, but also, um, as was referenced earlier, the work of, of Abraham Lincoln. I was very excited to hear that that's something that um, was referenced. Um, Lincoln on Leadership and A Team of Rivals are two outstanding books by um, different authors, but they celebrate the way that Abraham Lincoln brought different perspectives and approaches to his cabinet and to, to his learning um, and really um, helped him to become um, one of our most fantastic presidents. As we participate today, um, please share your truth. Keep an open mind and invite others to uh, and join in the conversation. But we also know that we learn most by listening. Um, so that is my cue to stop talking and to turn it over to Dr. Harvey, um, who will take the next segment. Thank you, Dr. Snopkowski. Um, so as, as was mentioned, uh, coherence is a framework that is being used in the Avon Grove School District um, to make sure that we are putting the right drivers in place to enact action um, within our schools, within our district, and of course, within our systems. We almost realized in hindsight uh, after we started to build our online academy and had a minute to breathe and reflect that whether we realized it or not, we did actually put those drivers in place. Uh, moving forward now, uh, as we look to uh, advanced education in the Avon Grove School District, we are going to do it in a more intentional and purposeful way. We obviously can't cover a complete framework within our time together this morning, so this will just be a highlight of some of the uh, benefits of the framework, some of the research behind it, and uh, some possible ways for you to take some pieces of this and perhaps use it in your work planning for the future of education in your districts. Coherence was first published in 2016, so about five years ago. And it includes the concept of being a coherence maker in chaotic times. I have to wonder if Fullen and Quinn had any idea just how chaotic things would be four years later in 2020. You were sent a summary article ahead of time. Hopefully you had an opportunity to preview that. In the summary article, you may have read that coherence making can help to alleviate initiative and innovative fatigue. Uh, some of you may be able to relate to that. We often put out initiative after initiative um, and, and might find ourselves fatigued. The way that coherence addresses that is by ensuring that there is a shared depth of understanding about the nature of the work. When we built our online academy for the start of the 2020-2021 school year, we actually began with making sure that our entire administrative team had a shared understanding of the work. Uh, next slide, please, Dr. Koch. Just to talk a little bit more about the framework, there are four drivers that are identified. Uh, focusing direction builds collective purpose, Cultivating collaborative cultures develops capacity. Deepening learning accelerates the improvement and innovation. And securing accountability helps build capacity from the inside out. Co uh, Fullen and Quinn would say that focusing direction gets you into the game. Cultivating collaborative cultures provides the pathway for change among the team once you're in the game. Deepening learning is the core strategy for affecting students' results. How are you going to win the game? And then securing accountability is essential to measure growth and be accountable to ourselves and the public. So knowing if you won and why or why not and how you're gonna improve for the next time. Next slide, Dr. Koch. So we are gonna have you start engaging right away with each other this morning. Uh, in your handouts on page two, you have our first activity. It's a quote walkabout protocol to preview coherence and to look a little bit more at all of the concepts that go into the coherence framework. So in your breakout rooms, you're gonna to work together. Uh, it might be with a partner, you may have a few other people um, to complete the activity using page two in your guided notes. There are eight quotes for you to consider, all from the coherence framework. As you consider these quotes, think about which ones resonate with you the most and why, and then also how these quotes relate it to the work that you did 
to um, maintain a continuity of education and prepare your district to deliver services this year. Again, the guided notes are in the chat just in case you need to refer to them. We're gonna spend about five minutes in the breakout rooms right now and then we'll all come back together and keep moving forward. So uh, Dr. Hudson, if you could please move the participants into the breakout rooms. Well, I hope everyone had an opportunity to share some of their things. Nikki, do you want me to continue with our story? Yes, please. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I didn't know if you wanted to recap there as we came back in. Um, we're looking forward to the continuing conversation to be thought partners in this journey as we continue to uh, share our story, but also learn from everyone else as well, because we know that uh, in education, it's really about continuous improvement and how can we continuously improve and learn from each other as we go through this unprecedented times, as you say. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Avangrove's story, the pre-pandemic, what our school district was about. Um, we're gonna start with our mission and our vision. <clears throat> In Avangrove, we wanted all of our students to foster a love of learning uh, and create an environment where all students can exceptionally be well-prepared for the future that they would like to have in their lives. Um, you know, little did we know, uh, Future Ready would be thrusted upon us with a pandemic uh, and try to educate in a different way. Um, we were excited about where our mission and vision was leading us, but we knew we still had to adjust and make um, uh, alterations to what we wanted to plan out as we move forward. Next slide, Jason. Give a snapshot of what Avon Grove looks like. We're about 5,000 students in Southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, predominantly, we are uh, of Hispanic and white descent. We have about 93% of our students that come from that demographic. Uh, we are about average with the state in terms of our uh, special education. Our English language learner is 8.8% and our economically disadvantaged is about 28.4%. Uh, we saw a slight um, uptick in that due to the pandemic. Uh, but certainly we uh, value all of the uh, demographics that we get to experience here in Avangrove and celebrate. Ne next slide, Jason. As part of our strategic plan, Avangrove uh, identified shared values that they believe are essential in all of our constituents, believing in what our students can accomplish. Uh, our students are unique, have personalized goals and understand what is necessary to achieve those goals. We wanna to continue to provide opportunities through hiring the best educators that we can find to serve our students. We wanna to continue to promote lifelong learning. I think that's exceptionally uh, our goal and mission in Avangrove. And obviously our partners with our parents uh, is a critical attribute. This is something that we value here in Avangrove and continue to look forward to as we continue to grow uh, in our technology and infrastructure. Uh, using our stakeholders to help us identify goals moving forward as we are about to embark on our own strategic planning. And then obviously financially making the decisions that are best aligned with what our goals are in the Avangrove community. Next slide, Jason. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Snopkowski who will take us through a little bit about our future ready and um, our annual report and move from there. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Um, so, so as Mr. Burns referenced, uh, the Evan Grove School District um, built a strategic plan uh, several years ago with uh, significant involvement and input from our community. And that strategic planning process has been the foundation of our work. And I, I really believe that at that time, our, our school board uh, had a significant amount of forethought um, and foresight in deciding that they wanted our students in Avon Grove School District to be ready for their futures. Um, we know that uh, when crafting mission statements and, and visions, um, they can be a lot about words and not a lot about action. Um, but we, we do recognize in Avon Grove School District that for our students to be successful, 
they have to be prepared for whatever the future is going to throw at them. And they have to be able to satisfy their unique needs as well as develop and implement their unique goals. Um, so it's, it's really a, a very um, strong statement um, made by our board of school directors at that time and has been followed through um, through the reading of our mission and vision at every one of our public meetings um, that we really believe that our, our most important role and our most important responsibility as, a, as an educational organization is to help each student achieve what he or she has decided is going to be most important for their futures. Um, next slide, Dr. Koch. In order for us to be successful um, throughout the pandemic, um, there were a number of things um, that, that were in place for us as a school district prior to the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we are very fortunate that in many instances, um, we had um, components, if not actual structures in place, and that the work of, of our team has been supported by our board of school directors over the last several years, not just in support, um, in concept, but also through the financial commitments that were necessary for us to have the structures and the components in place to be successful. Um, when we look back at, at where we were at the beginning of this process, um, we recognize that one of the most important things that we had done as a district and one of the most important things that the board had invested in was the use of technology um, and that technology being in the hands of every student in different ways. Um, at the time of the pandemic, we had nine of our 13 grades um, had um, technology available to them on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and for the grades that didn't, um, they had access to technology in classrooms. Um, but at the beginning of this process, we were able to utilize the, the vast amount of technology to be able to get technology into every student's hands um, during the course of last spring, as well as to enhance the, the amount of technology that was available for our students during the course of the summer. Um, it was really the culmination of a five-year rollout and planned process that had been supported by our board. Um, and it in included district-wide coaching and support for our teachers and for our administrators that came somewhat from consultants, but mostly from an internal team of teachers who had been um, really assigned and had demonstrated that they were ready to engage in a significant amount of coaching to support their colleagues and our administrative team. Throughout this process, we also relied heavily on the fact that we had selected a single LMS for our school district in Schoology. Um, many of the districts um, who we um, communicated with at the beginning of this process for us four and five years ago really stressed the importance of making a decision about an LMS and sticking with it so that there is continuity and consistency for students and for teachers and for administrators. Um, and the, the Avon Grove School District, um, through partnering with um, really piloteers um, at our middle school, gathering information from our teachers, as well as students who um, were part of a pilot program, selected Schoology um, to be our LMS. And then we've used that not only for um, implementation in the classrooms, um, but also for our professional development. We've used that for our flexible PD, where teachers have taken courses through Schoology to understand what it is like to be a student in a course, as well as our administrative team modeling the use of Schoology as a location and as a repository for much of our professional development and much of the information that is shared out with our teams throughout the course of the year. In addition to that, the Evan Grove School District, I believe, has one of the more robust curriculum review cycles um, in the area. Um, now being facilitated and led by Dr. Harvey, um, the curriculum review cycle for the Avon Grove School District utilizes our own teachers to become content area, not just experts, but also practitioners through the understanding by design model. And by having our teachers involved in this process throughout the multiple years of our curriculum review cycle, it has given our teachers a much deeper understanding and appreciation, not just of the content that they're teaching, but how the content needs to be aligned within a year across classrooms and across multiple years within our school district. Um, there's a very clear alignment of our work, grades K through 12 and all of our curricular areas. And we've leaned on that heavily throughout this process, not only in the development of our courses for the online academy and throughout the pandemic, but also in relying on teachers who then became leaders of this work in their individual classrooms, in their grades, and across our multiple buildings. And finally, as we've referenced multiple times, the Evan Grove School District is fully supportive of our students being future ready. 
Um, we began this process by crafting a mission and a vision multiple years ago. And it was just a couple of years ago that um, with the continued work that, that Michael Fullen is doing around this process and developing, you know, the, really the pedagogy for deeper learning, um, that the infographic that you see here has become much more visible and much more present in the Avon Grove School District. Um, we've provided multiple examples for our community through our annual report and through other communications of how we really believe as an Avon Grove School District um, organization in the six C's of education. Um, we know that this originally began with the four C's and then Michael Fullen added the two additional C's uh, several years ago. Um, but as a framework for our thinking and as a reference point for ourselves, for our teachers and for our community, um, this really captures and really encapsulates the work that we want to be able to do in all of our classrooms in supporting our students and being best prepared for their futures. Okay. And at that time, I will turn it back over to Dr. Harvey. Okay, everyone, we are going to get right back to some engaging work in your breakout rooms again. If you could take a look at page three in your handouts, you're going to have the opportunity now to think about how, whether you knew it or not, you were a coherence maker during the chaotic time of having to pivot to online learning during the COVID-19 pandemic. You'll see on page three, there's a chart with the four drivers, focusing direction, cultivating collaborative cultures, deepening learning and securing accountability. There are also some descriptors there for each of those four drivers. So working in your breakout rooms, you're gonna take a look at the descriptors and think about some things that you put in place, some actions that you took to provide the best possible education during these chaotic times in your districts and list them there as evidence. You're gonna take about five minutes or so to do this. In your handouts on pages six through nine are additional infographics that further explain the four drivers. So if you need more examples or need some further explanation, check out those infographics on pages six through nine. So again, work with your teams for about five minutes and reflect back on what you did to take action to make sure that you put the best possible education in place during the chaotic times that we all experienced. So Dr. Hudson, we'll return to our breakout rooms now. And welcome back everyone. Hope you had some good conversations in your breakout rooms. We are going to uh, continue on. I just wanted to point out a couple things. We are going to now move into the, really the pandemic phase or the pandemic era of this presentation. So we broke the presentation out into before the pandemic, during the pandemic and after the pandemic. So we're gonna move into the during phase. I will tell you though, we very much recognize that we all lived this. We are all still living it and we are not going to go through a timeline or a historical reenactment of what has occurred during the pandemic. Um, but we did really through the opportunity of putting this presentation together, have a lot of time to reflect on some of the key steps that we took and that we made. So uh, we'll start with another full and quote here, uh, be a coherence maker in chaotic times. No doubt about that. And as you listen to our story, there is a space if you are using paper or the digital version, if you want to take notes on page four, your task during our story during this during pandemic phase is going to be to look at those different drivers, look at the evidence that you collected and then compare it to our evidence. As leaders, we accept vulnerability and we are more than happy to you know, share our ups and downs to help you reflect on, on your journey as well. Uh, we'd also point out you are welcome to use the chat if you want to put any questions in there as we go. Uh, we do have time built in for questions and discussion as we go through the different, the different parts of our pandemic response here. 
Change is a process, not an event. We continue to change, evolve, and, and grow. And with that, we'll start with, we're gonna really jump, jump past that survival phase. So we're gonna jump past the spring where uh, we know that a lot of things had to get into action very quickly. Uh, the quality of the instruction was not where we wanted it to be. We knew that we were in survival mode, uh, but it was very important for us as we came out of survival mode to dial into the feelings, the thoughts of our community, of our, of our caregivers, of our students. And here we're sharing what was some of that feedback that we received. And you know, it, it included all of these things that the, the inconsistent schedules were difficult for families to manage, that we need to improve our access to, to technology, that we needed to have more consistency. Um, that our work was meaningful, you know, of course, that our work was not busy work, that we were very well aware of the depth of knowledge that we were, you know, asking our students to access in their assignments, that we provided more live instruction. Uh, we started out entirely asynchronously, and, you know, that grew a little bit through the spring, but we knew that we needed to have a strong plan for synchronous instruction once we started school back in the fall. Uh, inconsistent expectations. Uh, so did some of that come from communication, from just not as, as much time to meet as the difficulties meeting? You know, absolutely. Uh, we really worked on that, and you'll see that in a lot of the guides that we created for our different stakeholder groups. We wanted our students and our families to still be connected to our schools, even while in a virtual environment. So we recognized that we needed to have club still meeting, we needed to have other events, we needed to have interaction. And we wanted to provide as many supports to, to everyone as possible and to break down a disconnect between students and teachers. So one of the things that uh, was a benefit to us was that over the summer, our school board made the decision that we were gonna start the school year entirely online. And what that did was give us the time to put together a program that, that we knew that we could be proud of. You'll see as we go through this different links um, in the presentations, this picture is the cover page of our parent guide for the Online Learning Academy. We put these in not to go through today, but as resources for you when you go back and if you are interested in going back and looking at uh, anything else in this presentation. Our staff supplement really working on that consistency piece is included in this as well. But our, our mission for our online academy was a really strong determination that it was going to be our learners, our educators, and our curriculum. We were not outsourcing any of this. This was gonna be Avangrove through and through. And while we only had weeks uh, to put it together, that was very much our goal in getting through all of this. We knew it was a big task, um, but another full in term here, we had to use simplexity. We had to use this, this monumental task and we had to break it down into pieces that we could collect feedback on so that we had a collaborative process so that we were really reaching that goal of our students, our curriculum and our educators. Why did we do all this? Well, that overarching goal, we wanted to provide the same stellar Avangrove School District educational opportunities virtually while maintaining unity and relationships amongst our community. And we said it very simply, we are trying to take our brick and mortar school and put it online. And we're doing it in a very, very quick time frame. And as we get through this, you'll, you'll hear you know, again, the ups and downs, um, but a lot of the, the successes as well. So we, we developed four main areas to how we were going to create our online academy. And we made sure that our plans had guiding principles and uh, collaboration to develop really the questions that really became essential to us in developing this. And these are our four areas. And the next part of our presentation will break down some more details of each area. So our first one will be equity engagement. And then we'll talk about our educational program, pupil services, and then operations and logistics. And how did we do it? 
Well, we needed to be flexible. We had needed to have that flexibility to pivot between in-person instructional practices and remote online practices. We asked everyone to have that growth mindset, to give your best faith effort, to put your guard down, to try something new, to take a risk, and to see what we could accomplish as a community. And together, we really worked to ensure that we were upholding our district's vision and mission. And now to talk about equity engagement, I'll pass it back to Dr. Harvey. Thank you, Dr. Koch. So um, going back to our why, our what, and our how, solidifying those answers were really how we set out to develop that shared depth of understanding that we talked about as being key for the coherence framework. So out of the four areas, um, I have the opportunity to share with you about equity and engagement. You saw our demographics. We knew going into this that we were going to have learners who were at a disadvantage. And we knew as a result of that, they may not engage with us during this 100% online educational model. And so we took action. Here are some things that we put in place in order to try to provide more equitable and engaging services to our learners. We reassigned an assistant principal specifically to address equity and engagement. Our district doesn't have anyone serving currently as a director of engagement or equity. Um, and so we, we saw that need. We have an amazing assistant principal who you'll see um, on future slides, who um, is a, a, a Latina. She was an English learner. She lives in our community. She has built trust and relationships with that population. And we knew that um, she could really make some great strides for us here. We also made sure that we had socialization opportunities for students through online clubs and extracurriculars. So again, everything that we would have offered after school, um, we offered online. We made sure we had social and emotional support services for the diverse family needs. We made sure we had equitable access and support for technology needs. Uh, Dr. Koch is gonna talk more about that in his section, um, but we were able to, to immediately get out Wi-Fi, Chromebooks, everything that our students needed to be online. We collaborated with community organizations. We are very fortunate in Avongrove to have several community organizations, um, including local nonprofits and churches who wanted to partner with us. And we took them up on that right away. We needed all the help that we could get for our learners. And then we also tried to be proactive to put supports in place for attendance and truancy concerns. We didn't wait to see if students were going to, to not engage and to start um, accumulating absences, we put some supports in place right away to be more proactive with that. Next slide, Dr. Koch. Here is Dr. Natalie Ortega Moran, the assistant principal that I mentioned previously. Um, some of her work this year involved ensuring that we had effective communication for our Spanish speaking families. So among our Hispanic population, 20% um, of our parents and caregivers are Spanish speaking only. And so it's so important for us to make sure that everything we do goes out in English and Spanish. Um, Dr. Ortega Moran hosts informational meetings for our Spanish speaking families. Uh, they're called Padres Latinos meetings. Uh, they started prior to COVID and we would probably have 30 to 40 families attend. Um, now our attendance is in the 150s. We have families really engaging. Um, they trust Dr. Ortega Moran. They're not afraid to ask questions. The meetings are held in Spanish and they just really feel comfortable um, in coming and, and learning more about how to support their learners at home. As you can see here, we conduct home visits. Dr. Ortega Moran does a huge portion of them, but all of us have been out in the homes uh, doing whatever was needed to find out uh, why our students weren't engaging and what we could do about that. And then again, we monitor attendance and um, as I mentioned with the community organizations, we coordinate learning pods. If you can go to the next slide, Dr. Koch. Um, uh, just jump ahead for me one and then we'll go back. Here are some pictures of our learning pods. Um, these uh, pictures here over on the right are in a local church. And then over on the left, we have a community organization called The Garage. It's a nonprofit. 
that uh, supports our Hispanic population after school and now during school. So for our students who may not have the best home environment or they needed more support from an adult during the day, um, they have opportunities to go and learn um, in these locations. It has made a huge difference for us. Um, they are provided with everything they need to learn, but then also to make sure that their basic needs are met in terms of food and warmth and comfort. Um, and if you could just go back for me one slide, Dr. Koch, thank you. Um, this is an example too of, of some things that we saw on our home visit. So you'll see over on the left a before picture. So uh, we visited a home and these wonderful learners that we had um, were learning on a chair and they had very little in terms of a home learning setup with a desk um, and materials and so forth. And so then you'll see the after picture here. We took them a desk and a chair. And so really just looking at equity in terms of what does each individual learner need in order to be able to fully engage in our online academy was the approach that we took. And we saw a lot of success with that. And you can go ahead and move forward, Dr. Koch. So we are gonna pause now and open it up for the first time this morning to our larger group um, for you to have the opportunity to ask questions um, or to comment. What can you relate to? Um, what did you do that we could also learn from? On the slide that Dr. Koch had, we have some examples there of uh, evidence that we would say count it towards the four drivers and we'll look at those when we come back together but I'm just going to pause to see if anyone has any questions you're welcome to take the mic or put them in the chat or would like to comment about your experience with equity and engagement um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. I have really good wait time, so please don't be shy. We'd love to hear from you. Well, uh, I mean, I, I can just this quick comment. It, you know, it's it's funny to hear what other people have experienced because it's all so very real and similar to what we, you know, had or are going through. And uh, you know, we had the made the decision at the beginning of the year at Cape and Lopen to open school at the beginning of the year. So we were balancing the in-person for our elementary, remote for anyone who chose it, and hybrid for secondary. And you know, all the all the components are pretty much the same. You know, just making sure that kids who are not with us are actually being supported. And I love the idea of your learning pods. Um, that just really kind of is such a nice idea. Um, so anyway, it just was like a lot of head nodding and then some nerve, some anxiety coming up from the things that we experienced during that time, you know, that I'm sure that we all have some post-traumatic stress on that, but um, it's not, I mean, it, it is, it's, it's nice to see the take and, and also to see how um, similar the, the, some of the processes and outcomes are to what we did and the things that we felt were successful we can kind of see that parallel and mirrored in what you guys did and then some of our challenges. It's nice to hear what you guys did to address some of those to give us some ideas. So thank you for that. Absolutely, thank you for sharing. I think trauma is a good word and uh, empathy for sure, hearing others' experiences and being able to relate. Anyone else? All right, we'll go back to the slides, Dr. Koch, and just quickly look again at what we would think uh, would be evidence of the four drivers here. So um, holding focus groups um, with to get a variety of opinions, looking at our survey data, we acted to create a new position. We uh, reached out for community organization support. Um, that's just from focusing direction, but you can see some other evidence here um, that we felt as though aligned to the coherence framework. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Snopkowski for him to talk to us about the educational program that was designed. Thank you once again, Dr. Harvey. Uh, the, the educational program that we um, endeavored to design was one that we, as was stated earlier, would be able to mirror what we would normally expect any um, outcomes that we would want our students to experience in our classrooms if they were with us day by day in the brick and mortar setting. 
Um, we were most interested in involving our teachers in this process because we recognized very early on um, that our teachers were going to be the ones who were going to be in most instances the first face that our students were going to see in the mornings. Um, they were going to be the ones who through their own mindset and through their own um, work with our students were going to create really the tone and the manner in which our students were going to begin to feel successful as online learners, as well as for their caregivers and parents to believe that they were getting an education that mirrored what we would have if they were in our classrooms on a day by day basis. Um, so we recognized very early on that we needed to have our teachers involved in this process and we wanted our teachers to be involved in, in ways that would not only um, relate back to the development of the courses, but also how the courses were going to be developed um, for our other um, our other colleagues and, and the other teachers to be actually be able to deliver on a day by day basis. Um, we recognize that not every student needed the same things and we wanted to make certain that our uh, our educational program would meet the needs of individual learners. And so we specifically targeted the manner in which we were going to be interacting with our English learners and supporting them with their needs. Um, we looked specifically at how students, when they were struggling, were going to have an opportunity to receive the same system of supports through our MTSS framework that they would receive from our reading specialists. And at that time, our math specialists who would have the opportunity to work and support the students as their needs were identified at the classroom level. Um, our educational program in a normal situation is built upon the, the gradual release of responsibility framework um, by Fisher and Fry, and we wanted our courses in this environment to be able to mirror that so that our students and our teachers would have not just the consistency from previous years, but believing that we will at some point in time move forward from the pandemic we wanted these years or these these months i should say to be able to prepare students for future success in our classrooms and using a, a pedagogy that that our teachers are comfortable and confident with and that our students are used to and so those core components that we look for in each of our lessons we wanted to make certain that those were visible within the individual courses that were being designed and across all of our grades um, as you'll remember from the data that was shared from our parents that was missing in the spring and we identified and targeted that very early on that it was a necessary component of all the work that we were going to be doing moving forward. Uh, we were very fortunate um, as a team that we had um, multiple members of our team who had experienced the development and the implementation of online learning in other locations uh, before coming to Avon Grove and building upon those experiences as well as using research based practices. Um, it allowed us to, to really consider the manner in which we wanted our students to interact and to learn on a day by day basis. And then we were able to think about that at the front end before we began to design the courses that eventually became the, the daily instructional um, components for our students. Um, next slide, Dr. Koch. What we really wanted to make certain that we were doing too is building from success. Um, we, we certainly recognize that there are things in our uh, educational organization that were working well before the pandemic, and we certainly wanted to reference and, and build from those. And, and we really believe that, as I referenced earlier, some of the components and the foundational aspects that were, were there were the things that allowed us to, to begin to be successful with our students. Um, we really wanted our teachers and our students to have ways in which they could interact. Um, so we really were intentional about the fact that we wanted our teachers and our students to build connections with each other. Um, there is an awful lot of research specifically related to the social emotional learning needs of students and how those needs need to be met for there to be significant learning happening in classrooms. And so especially at our primary grades, but, but certainly through all of our grades, and we really wanted to emphasize with our teachers that the interactions that they're going to have with their students are going to be the foundation for the success that they would have as learners uh, moving throughout the year. And to do that, we needed our teachers and our students to interact with each other directly in a synchronous format. Uh, we recognize that there are certainly times and we had to develop a program that, that incorporated asynchronous instruction, but we really wanted to have an opportunity to maximize the amount of time and the, really the intentional and productive interactions between teachers and students to help them be successful. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and so when we think about an appropriate balance of online and offline activities, one of the things that um, we certainly saw in the research and we wanted to make certain that we were able to identify and then incorporate, especially as we hosted focus groups with parents throughout the summer, was that they, they certainly recognized that there would be a need for students to be learning online, but they didn't want the online experience to be a full day's experience for their, for their children. 
Um, we also recognize that that is just not developmentally appropriate for many of the, the students who would have been in our classrooms to have as much screen time um, as, as a normal day's activities would include. Um, so we really were intentional about building in not just those interactions that would be uh, occurring with students and with teachers um, directly, but we also wanted to have meaningful experiences for students that they could engage in beyond the technology. Um, obviously, the, the materials and the resources that um, we, we really needed to get into our students' hands um, went beyond the actual uh, Chromebooks that our students were assigned. Um, we had multiple opportunities um, for caregivers to come to our schools to pick up curriculum kits, to pick up manipulatives, to pick up um, bags of supplies, whether that be for an art classroom, whether it be a workbook or a journal that would then be available at home for a student to engage with their ELA teacher. Um, we, we really were intentional about making those materials available across multiple days and multiple evenings for our, our caregivers to come to our schools because we recognized that our students needed those in their hands to be successful. And we also recognized that we needed to have, um, and, and as someone who is trying to, to really dig into grading as a concept and the value of grading, I, I, I hesitated to use the word traditional. Um, but for the, the circumstance that we were in, we, we really needed our teachers and our students um, to really um, be moored to something that they were used to um, at this time. Um, so our grading practices, whereas in the spring, they were um, much um, more loose and students really, the, the, the grading process became very um, inconsistent. We really wanted our teachers to return to the formative assessment practices that they would be using ongoing in their classrooms. And then also back to the summative assessment practices that would, would feed the information to our students and, and then to our caregivers about how students were doing and how they were progressing within each classroom. Um, those grading practices are, we are continuing to look at and evaluate and modify. Um, really, that's one thing that has not stopped being a, an area of emphasis for us. Um, but it is something that, you know, as we began this process, we, we certainly wanted to have something that for our students and our teachers was a more consistent practice that they were used to. So at that point, um, I would like once again, um, we'll stop the screen share. And at that point, um, if there are any questions or comments or thoughts um, really to, to speak to the educational program and how we, we created the program to be successful for our students, I would be more than happy to, to engage with that now or answer any questions. Don't be fooled, this group is not usually that quiet. Oh, Bridget, I thought you were going to, to add. I feel free oh, to- no, I thought I'd try to get some prompts on. Great. I'll ask a question, although I'm not in a district right now. Um, I can't help but ask this question. I might be getting ahead um, of the of the program, but um, a lot of families are expressing a desire for uh, virtual teaching and online learning to continue after the pandemic. Um, what are your thoughts? And it, I mean, it appears um, that you're in a perhaps a more advanced, uh, better position, quite frankly, than than many would be to offer a um, a rigorous uh, quality uh, virtual online experience. Have, has your team begun to think about what the 21-22 school year looks like with other, other opportunities for student learning up outside of the four walls of a classroom? Certainly. So one of the things I think, uh, Mark, that's going to be really important for our team to continue to, to dig into is what is our community asking of us to support the learners in our community. Um, we recognize that, that prior to this, um, we probably, if we had been tasked with creating the systems that are currently in place, we might have put a three or a five year timeline on putting the systems in place. And we got it done in about three and a half weeks. And now we're living it and experiencing it about five months in. Um, I, I think, you know, when we look at where we are as, a, as an organization, 
Uh, we recognize that while it has been incredibly difficult, there are opportunities that are now available to our students that didn't exist before. And we could not, I don't believe in good conscience, go completely back to what we had been doing. Um, our expectations for our community, and obviously we have some community members on this call, um, we, we have an expectation that has now been established by our community that we're going to continue to meet the needs of our learners in a variety of ways. For our students, um, there's no way of knowing specifically what level of trauma they have encountered during the last several months. We will have students when we get to the beginning of the 21-22 academic year who may not have set foot in our classrooms in 18 plus months. And thinking about what we're going to need to be able to provide, and it's, it's really appropriate that Mr. Burns is next up with pupil services, what we're going to need to provide for our students, not just individuals who may have a specific designation or a diagnosis, but really for all of our students, um, we're gonna really need to involve our community in that process. Um, we're really excited, I think, about what we have been able to accomplish, but I th think all of us in Heaven Grove recognize that it is actually just a first step. Um, we had families prior to the pandemic who were choosing um, to um, learn through a cyber charter or to, to experience other types of learning. And, and I think what we've now shown to our community is that we have the capacity and we have the expertise as a team to be able to deliver a high quality program. And I also believe that we now have potentially more caregivers and more students who want to be able to have a flexible experience that's going to allow them to potentially be in person, but also experience things that are more um, available when they need them. Um, and, and I really, uh, I, I can't emphasize enough uh, how much we've heard from our community in most instances that we have met or in many cases exceeded their initial expectations. But we also know that as we continue to grow as individuals and as an organization, we're gonna have to continue raising our expectations and providing the type of experience for our community that, that they're really gonna demand of us as we move forward. And I think the, the word that we keep using is reimagine. Uh, it really is an opportunity for us to reimagine where we can go with learning and having grow and how we're going to best be able to meet the needs of our community. And Dr. Marchese, I don't know if you'd like to add anything on to that. Yeah, I mean, I think Mike summarized kind of where, where we're kind of headed in terms of what the future will look like in the district relative to um, uh, virtual teaching. Uh, I think, you know, at the elementary level, the structure that we've implemented this year where we, we don't have an integrated approach, we actually have students who are 100% dedicated to the online academy versus the students who are currently in the in-person hybrid program. That's fairly easy to maintain moving forward where it gets a little tricky is at the secondary level where the majority of the districts are operating in an integrated model where kids are zooming into classrooms and teachers are actually having to manage both the in-person group and the students that are online. Um, that's, that's, I think, the area of conversation that we still need to continue to develop and figure out what's the best way to deliver that because I think the sustainability of operating a virtual secondary school separately from the face-to-face -face program is, is significantly different than what we're doing right now. Um, and there's lots and lots of resources that need to, to be basically dedicated in order to effectively replicate what we're, what we're doing at the elementary level. It can be done. I mean, our, I think our initial focus but before the pandemic was really to try to recruit, recruit those students in our district that were accessing cyber charter schools. And the, the, the whole charter school structure in Pennsylvania is very different than in the state of Delaware. Um, and we're, we were looking at that because we were seeing about $1.4 million of expenses that were going out of the district to support those students who were in the cyber programs. And we've started those conversations with the board about reinvesting a, an infrastructure to recruit those students to come back to the district. And we could definitely do that at, at a much more economical rate than what we would be um, um, paying for those students to attend uh, out of district charter school. So that secondary conversation, I think still needs to be future, uh, further developed, uh, but we are certainly uh, engaged in, the, in that conversation right now for next year. Could, could I ask you a question on a couple of things? Um, 
you're talking about the live streaming and we've had, you know, we've been doing a lot of, with remote that hasn't been live streamed. We're starting to move into that. I know with our elementary, we've been doing our immersion program as a live stream, which has its own challenges. Um, like you said, kids are in class and kids are online working with the same teacher. So what are your thoughts on how live streaming will play a role in that and how we can help teachers balance that? And the, the challenge that I keep coming up against, and especially the secondary level, is for assessment that, um, you know, kids who are digital or who are not going to be with us face to face, the requirement is that kids have to come in to take an assessment. And, I, and I'm not sure that that's the best model that we need to have um, from either, you know, state or federal type of situations. And even with um, College Board, I was on an AP meeting yesterday and the preferred method is for in-person um, they do have a digital format, but it's not as robust as the in-person type of testing. And that causes challenges, especially for families who are choosing for a specific reason to be remote, um, whether it's a health issue or something. Um, so I'm just wondering, what, how do you guys, how are you thinking about that as, as far as a cyber academy or ongoing type of digital offering would work within your district so that we can kind of think that through as you guys talk about that? Mike, Jason, you want to jump in? Do you want me to? I can jump in just on a, yeah. on a, I can jump in on a, a couple pieces of that. Um, one, our, our live streaming from the classroom, we're calling in our integrated model, has been going very well. Um, we've used a variety of, of cameras and resources and, and speaker phones to, to be able to do that. Um, I'll share in a little bit later how we did increase our, our bandwidth in the district. As far as moving forward uh, with an online academy, there are going to be a lot of decisions to make about that because there's just so many differences between elementary and secondary in the course offerings. And e even in developing our program now, um, you know, it was, it was uh, I was an elementary principal, so you know, I, I know that world the best. And I, I think it's fair to say, you know, we could really focus on those four core areas in elementary. Um, there was no way without doing an integrated model that we could offer all of the courses at a secondary level, particularly at the high school that we, that we needed to do, that, that we all need to do. So those are gonna be the tough decisions for us um, because we haven't enjoyed and our students have benefited from the synchronous instruction, um, but it will be really, really hard to do that in a district of our size and with about 5,000 students of having a separate virtual academy um, with that is going to include synchronous instruction without being an integrated, without having cameras on in classrooms. And that's probably not the, the future of what we're really looking at right now. I, I see our future and our discussions have more been in developing high school course catalogs that just offer variety to our students so that they have voice and choice in choosing not just uh, their courses and their course path, but how they take different courses. And we, we will most likely be going in a direction of you know, having a course catalog where you know, a course may be offered face-to-face -face in a hybrid, in an asynchronous or in a high flex model where students move in and out of seminars as needed. Um, there's, there's a lot of options there. Uh, other districts in our county have separate cyber, cyber academies, but they're the very large districts where they're combining students across two and three high schools and putting them together and just having the numbers that it makes sense. Um, so yeah, a lot, lot of options that we're considering that I'm sure you're, you're considering as well. And, and I think the whole assessment conversation is a completely different component because the whole idea of assessment, and we, we've kind of struggled through this, is it's, you can't assess the same way that, that you do in a traditional environment in the online environment. And that's, you know, we've seen that struggle uh, with an analyzing student grades out of the first quarter and then closing into the second quarter. And our secondary principals have really worked hard with their faculties to kind of look at grading practices and how they're assessing student learning differently in the online structure because our secondary schools just came back to hybrid at the end of January. So they were, they were virtual through the first semester in our school district. So we were tracking those changes in student performance from the end of the first quarter to the end of the second quarter or the end of the first semester. And our principals were engaging with their faculty leaders on ways in which they could look at assessment differently to address struggling learners in the classroom. So I think, again, that 
we don't have a hard and fast answer as to, you know, this is the secret sauce in terms of how to address assessment in the online environment. I think we're still in that experimenting phase and we're learning as our, our, our structures of teaching and learning are changing at the same time. Exactly. And just some of the technicalities of that. And Dr. Harvey might have some things to add to. Uh, we did purchase a lockdown browser uh, that is used by a lot of colleges. Um, we are we are using that with students um, at certain times. We are requiring cameras to be on for assessments. Um, we worked a lot with transportation to get students in as needed when face to face assessments um, were required. And you know, hopefully there's, there's a, a place out there for us where you know, we can have either a, an e-lounge or a cyber cafe or, or something along those lines that would be a flexible space for students to, to come in and out, not just for assessment, um, but to come in and out of that flexible course schedule where they might be, they might be in the building for a science lab, for a face-to-face -face course, and then do some asynchronous work in uh, some of the collaborative areas. Um, particularly collaborative areas in our in our new high school, uh, which will be coming online in about a year and a half, which is pretty exciting. Dr. Harvey. Yeah, thanks. I'll just add two quick things to that. As far as um, the assessments go in the online format, we did work with our vendor for our benchmarking assessment to develop protocol that they were comfortable with. Um, of course, they have to worry about their national norms and things like that being skewed by these different testing environments. Um, so for our elementary classrooms, we developed a protocol um, where first and foremost, we just kept trying to reiterate to our parents and caregivers the rationale for why they can't help their student on the assessments. We're still working through that uh, little humor this morning. You know, we, we had parents hiding behind curtains giving answers. I'm not sure, you know, what you guys experienced, but we're working through that. Um, and so our, our teachers have a protocol that they follow, you know, verbally giving that rationale, um, sending it in writing ahead of the benchmark assessment. And then we put our students into breakout rooms. They have to have their cameras on, their microphone on, um, they have to screen share. And our teachers just proctor, basically, move throughout the breakout rooms and monitor as much as they can. We put extra adults in there if we have them available so that we're closely monitoring and making sure our students are doing it as independently as we hope that they would. Um, the second thing that I'll add is um, we, for our English learners, we have about 400 English learners in our district, and we are um, about at the end of our WIDA access testing window. And for our English learners, about 20% of them are fully online, but we did bring them in person to uh, take the access tests. And it just involved a lot of coordination, a lot of conversations with the caregivers who were uncomfortable with that um, to try to make them feel more comfortable, let them know our, our safety protocols with plexiglass and distancing and all of that. And we've been pretty successful. Um, as of now, we have almost 90% completion and, and we, we haven't had anyone flat out refuse us yet. Um, our ESL teachers are absolutely amazing and they have great relationships with the families and that has helped. Um, so we did experience having to bring our online learners in for a required state assessment um, and learned a lot through that process that will carry us through um, if we have to administer our PSSAs and Keystone exams later this spring, which of course is will be for a lot more than 400 students um, and, and more online learners that will have to come in person. Um, so it's a challenge for sure. And I think, Michael, you had asked about and mentioned AP as well. Um, that's on the horizon, and our high school team is planning uh, on in person for that as well. Uh, they did a great job in providing SAT opportunities for students that were juniors um, that had not had the opportunity to take it, as well as uh, seniors who may not have had an opportunity to take it. They had uh, two different sessions, and I believe we had over 130 students in each of those sessions come in to take the SATs in person. Uh, so it was a great opportunity for our high school staff to, to be able to proctor that and provide that opportunity as well for our students. All right, that's probably a great segue to you, Mr. Burns, for the pupil services section. Great, thanks, Dr. Harvey. Um, this is probably where it was drastically different in our planning. Uh, as you heard, we were remote uh, or online uh, to begin the year. However, with special education, 
and our federal mandates of providing uh, FAPE or uh, free and appropriate public education for all students, we needed to think differently because online academy wasn't for everyone. So you're gonna hear as I talk in the next couple of minutes about how we plan for our special education services, uh, how we continue to evolve and, and implement differences for our 504 accommodations, our gifted education, as well as you heard Dr. Harvey mention our English language learners and what we planned and did uh, to serve them as well throughout this process. I'll talk briefly about our nurse, uh, who we actually created a nurse on special assignment this year, uh, because people services also entailed um, the review of COVID and its impact in our district, and also what we needed to do to respond to that. And then of course, uh, all important, our social emotional wellness, not only for our students, but our staff. Because as all of you know, this has been uh, an exhausting 11 months uh, as an educator, and we wanted to make sure that we had planned activities that were specific to responding to what they needed. Uh, and our principals have done a great job in continuing that work. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. So we're gonna first start with special education and 504 accommodations. One of the things we really needed to do is focus on a professional development that not only um, spoke to in-person instruction and online, and we needed to plan accordingly. So in-person instruction really started August 31st for our students in our life skills and our autistic support classes. We felt um, very strongly as a district and our board supported it 100% that we needed to provide a five day a week in-person full day program for our students and our life skills and autistic support. But as you know, during that time, it was very challenging because we were concerned. We were all concerned about the safety and well-being of our students, safety and well-being of our staff, and certainly wanted to make sure that we provided an education that was meaningful and that most importantly met their needs. We needed to partner with our parents to make sure that they were aware of what it was going to look like, that they understood the mitigation strategies that we were implementing to make sure that our students were safe and that our staff was safe. I would tell you about 80% of our, our parents uh, took us up on that opportunity, trusted that we had a good um, plan in place and sent their child back on August 31st. We did that K to 12. We had a small group in each of the buildings, our largest being 20 total in the high school. Um, and in the elementary centers, we had anywhere from uh, 10 to 15 in our elementary centers. So it was you know a small group uh, but then we had the adults that would be with them. And we had a committed group of teachers who were coming back, even though that their counterparts did not have to uh, report to the building every day. So it was uh, unique challenges and I think all embraced it and we had a successful opening. Uh, come October, we had an opportunity to um, kind of make an adjustment. That's when we started with our elementaries, offering the opportunity to bring our elementary centers back in, in a hybrid format. However, we extended the option for our families with students who had an IEP to come in five days a week. Some, again, took us up on that opportunity to come in five days a week because they were seeing that online learning wasn't necessarily for all. Uh, some stayed home because they believed that their student was still getting what they needed. They were getting the support uh, that they needed to be successful and they were continuing to uh, stay online uh, due to not only safety reasons, but also they felt like their child's needs were being met during that time. Uh, we continued to um, evaluate as we matriculated through November and into December and the growing numbers of COVID uh, became uh, a part of our community. We had some closures as a result of that. Uh, and that's where our nurse was really important in terms of contact tracing, making sure that we were communicating with our families and making sure that we we're communicating with our staffs. Uh, we held opportunities for parents to come in um, for online, from online to in-person, some took us up on that opportunity because maybe it became more of a struggle as we got into November and December. Uh, we continued to monitor our 504 students. Uh, for the most part, our students were successful in the online academy. There were a few that we needed to um, invite in and, and make adjustments and offer the opportunity to come in person and felt that it was better uh, coming in person five days a week. So we targeted that group as well and brought them in. Next slide, Jason. From, uh, you know, from special education and um, our 504 accommodations, we still, we had our gifted education. We 
partnered with the CCIU. We provided opportunities for our gifted support teachers to be able to network with county uh, teachers uh, to talk a little bit about pro project-based learning uh, in an online format, um, supporting students online, and also supporting our teachers who were supporting their teacher, our students, making sure that the goals were being implemented, uh, that they were following those uh, in the classroom, but also that our gifted support teachers had the opportunity to work with the students in the capacity that they typically would in an in-person format online. Uh, they were great supports, not only for our students, they communicate with the parents, held IEP meetings and GIEP meetings virtually. Uh, and of course, we identified students that were struggling learners in this format as well, because you know they may have had a gifted um, IEP, but there are also um, some things from an executive functioning standpoint that our students were struggling with. And we needed to identify whether or not it was best to bring them in and have those conversations and ultimately invite them in if that was best for them. Next slide, please. As you heard from Dr. Harvey, she talked a little bit about the equity and engagement piece. Uh, we have an outstanding uh, person in Dr. Ortega Moran, who not only communicates with our families in multiple ways, uh, our teachers do a phenomenal job. They use the app Talking Points uh, where they uh, communicate with families and it basically translates for them when families communicate back to them. Uh, we provided seven opportunities for, for evening events uh, online where Dr. Ortega Moran would uh, present to them. Dr. Marchese was a part of that as well, as well as all of our team members. Uh, we provided opportunities again in uh, October for the hybrid for our elementary centers. We stayed uh, in the virtual setting for uh, our secondary campus through December and into January. Uh, and Dr. Harvey's team did a great job with our WIDA access because as you know, state assessments didn't stop. Didn't stop uh, and we needed to provide opportunities for our students to, to be able to take the WIDA access. Um, and we're at, you know, at the point where we're getting near the end and a majority of our students have taken the assessment due to the fact that our teachers have done a great job in communicating with our families. Next slide. And then of course, uh, as I alluded to, social emotional well-being. This is something um, that's a important aspect of our roles as educators. We need to kind of check where we are. We need to make sure that we're in a good frame of mind to not only communicate and work with our, our staffs, but we recognize when our staffs need support. Um, we need to provide building level administrators support in this capacity as well. Uh, our um, and assistant principals have done a great job in continuing to spread uh, wellness throughout the uh, building. Um, in one building, we have uh, Wellness Wednesday, which one of our assistant principals uh, provides opportunities for teachers to connect via Zoom. Uh, and they you know, go over different exercises. It may be meditation. It may be mindfulness. It may be, hey, let's take a walk. You know, those kinds of things, just to make sure we're checking where we are and supporting one another throughout this process. Uh, we also provided um, professional development with partnering with Tom Stecker and Associates, which is an outside consultant who works with our teachers in, in this framework. Um, we had it at the conclusion of the 1920 school year, and we also had it at the midpoint in this January 25th at one of our professional developments where uh, his group partnered with each of our elementary campuses, and then we'll have another one in March with our secondary campuses, just to kind of make sure that we're all um, checking ourselves, making sure we're in a good spot and supporting one another throughout this process. And with that, I believe the next slide is any questions or comments that people may have related to pupil services. And we'll take the slide down right now and we'll talk a little bit about that. Hi, uh, this is Kevin Fitzgerald from Cesar Rodney. Um, I was just wondering uh, what type of restrictions um, you faced from your, you know, from public health or, or from the state with regard to bringing the number of students back into in-person learning? Kevin, great, great question. Um, and I can tell you, and Chris, I know you want to jump in as well. <laughs> that was something that we considered, um, you know, throughout this process. We followed all of the mandates that were outlined by the Chester County Health Department in the beginning of this. Um, things changed throughout the year for us. It moved from the Chester County Health Department to requirements that PDE also uh, required us to uh, have in place and also tracking the cases as it related to COVID throughout the um, 
time that we were in. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they understood that we were going to meet six feet of distance, that students would be required to wear masks. If they could not wear masks, that we had provided them with a face shield uh, of some sort. These were some of the steps and mitigation strategies that we felt very strongly about. Um, we got support from our board and certainly from our superintendent, but our, also our local health department in the things that we did. Uh, so we really partnered with them to make sure that we were implementing things in a way that was safe. And most importantly, that our families felt good about what we were doing. Uh, because we weren't going to offer something where we weren't going to have families that were going to be invested in this, knowing that there are some risks involved here, that um, we, were, we were very concerned about that. But um, through um, our work with our solicitors, through our work with our uh, health department, and also our board, we were able to all offer this for our families. So Chris, I, I saw you took that off there. Let, yeah. let me ask a let me ask a follow up then. How sure. how did you balance or how do you balance uh, if you should have uh, more parents or students that want in person as opposed to a virtual remote learning environment? Did you have to make that decision? Yeah, we're kind of going through that right now. So I mean, I think the biggest restriction to get to the, your first question was is six feet social distancing. I mean that yeah. that has been essentially mandated by our local health department and reinforced at the state level. The other collar counties of Philadelphia, I'll name one of them, Bucks County, which is in the, on the northern side of Philadelphia. Um, they their health department gave school districts a three to six foot range. So that. That in itself allowed those school districts in Bucks County to really come back to school more fully for a, a, a much more cross-sectional base of students than what you're seeing in our region, which is primarily mm -hmm. targeted student populations. We, we believe that in the next week or so, we'll be getting some updates and guidance that will allow us to reduce um, uh, distancing in the classroom that will allow us to open up and expand uh, our, our instructional programs more to a, a full five day a week program. What we're doing right now, uh, as I mentioned that we just brought secondary back about three weeks ago. So what we're doing now is kind of looking at, okay, in order to maintain six feet of distancing, how many more kids could we potentially bring into the schools on a more regular basis? So we're looking at like multiple failure kinds of students, seniors, uh, seniors and looking at seniors and those kinds of things too to really maximize on the classroom space at six feet of distancing. Mm -hmm. But as soon as that six feet of distancing changes and, and we get are given a range, we can go more full scale into what uh, teaching and learning looked like pre-pandemic. But the six feet of social distancing has been the big restriction in front of us. Do you have, do you have restrictions with, for, with regard to transportation? We have 23 on a bus for us and, and that poses an issue. No, there has been no restrictions on transportation. And, um, you know, fortunately, you know, our community, most of the parents are driving their kids to school. We have mm. uh, very low ridership on our on our buses right now. Um, but we have been very clear with our community that the one area that we probably can't uh, meet the, the mitigation strategies is on the bus. And there's nothing that requires school districts to implement or put a uh, or putting a cap on on a bus. So we're just trying to to we're trying to create the 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 environments as close to what the guidance is suggesting. But that's the one area that we've told families like that's probably the one area where there's going to be a lot of compromise. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, Dr. Koch, if we could share the screen back again and just kind of to summarize what we needed to go through uh, before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Koch. You know, we provided um, a structure at the beginning of the year for our students. CARES was our theme for our special education. Uh, and really what it was about was connecting with our families, making sure we're adapting our practices and responding to what our students need, providing the education that we certainly want them to have, and most importantly, serve our community. So we really focused that as our theme for the year. Ultimately, in the end, in terms of our accountability, we need to make sure that we're providing fate for all of our students, that we're doing it in a safe way, but obviously maintaining the things that are required by state for us to provide for our students. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Koch, who'll talk about operations and logistics. 
Okay, thank you very much. So I'll just start with saying, while we call this operations and logistics, this is operations and logistics for our online academy, which really then turned into our, our hybrid plan as well. So the lens that I bring to this, along with to the director of technology position, is coming from 13 years as a building administrator. And you know, just looking at that perspective, and I remember becoming an administrator and, you know, a lot of people suggesting or recommending that you don't forget your time as a teacher when you become a principal. And when you move to those district and central office positions, you don't, it just builds. You don't forget your time as a principal. You don't forget your time as a teacher. And of course, you always think about your, your students and our student-centered approach. So you'll see on the screen and in the presentation, we do have a link to our online academy technology plan. Um, all the links that we shared today, they're all public documents. They're all on our website as well. Here's some of the topics that we'll cover in the next uh, couple minutes here as we go through operations and logistics. So just to give you a little more of an idea, some background on what our schedules look like. Uh, we did start the year entirely online with our, um, as we continued on and we were starting to open our schools. Uh, we started with our elementary schools opening first, and then a couple of weeks later, our middle school, and then eventually our high school a week after them. Uh, we went through and we put into our, our student information system a learning preference for every student based on family feedback, if they were going to be hybrid, if they were going to be in our online program, or if they were in one of our cohorts, whether that was special education, our English learners, or now we're adding a, a fifth cohort of 100% of uh, secondary students who have failing grades or are on the border of failing courses. We're starting to put plans in place to bring them back as well. So we had different cohorts. In our elementary program, uh, we divided our classes. Some of our classes were entirely online classes. So those students participated in synchronous instruction with their teacher all day long. And then we have our students who are in, their, in our hybrid program. And those students are in school half a day every day. That was the best way to get them the most time in school and the most consistency for our families. And then the other half of the day, they are working on some asynchronous courses. They are uh, also getting some of their support services during those times as well. Our middle school made a decision to transition to a block schedule as a result of the pandemic. Uh, this not only gave more time in their classes, but cut down on transmissions and the possibility of then COVID transmission from switching classes as much. So they did a lot of professional learning to make that change. Our high school um, and middle school are both on that integrated schedule where we are live streaming into our classrooms so that we can provide all of those courses for those students. Here are some of the things that were really the keys to consistency. You heard about in our first parent survey, trying to increase our consistency. One thing we were fortunate to be able to do is we, we did create some new positions. We put teachers on special assignment for remote learning in all of our buildings. So they became a connection uh, really between uh, just so many different people. Um, one, a, a connection to all of our directors, but also connections to our curriculum supervisors. They were supports for our building principals and they really helped us manage our course building. So we, we built and just digitized and digitized course after course after course, beginning at the beginning of August and, and still ongoing. We built uh, course frames so that each of our lessons within a course had a, a consistent model that related back to that gradual release of responsibility, which was already being used. We used that model to build our course frames. We developed consistent accountability, consistent course design. We provided the same training uh, for all of our educators, whether uh, it was our administrators taking the training and then leading the training, or uh, whether it was for our teachers at various levels. So something that might be at least uh, a little unique to us or something that we're really proud of is our master course building process. So we used master, master course building as the foundation for course design. So our course builders, they really established that consistency to have common courses for uh, 
about, it ended up being, I think, a little over 150 courses. And again, so these courses were written. This was written curriculum that we had to digitize. We built course shells. And what we did was we looked at courses that had multiple sections or had an uh, AP status or had other unique areas where we needed to make sure we had that consistency. And we started uh, building those courses with course designers. We had a lot of teachers that stepped up that wanted to be a part of this. We um, worked with our instructional technology specialist to, to build all of this in Schoology. So they went through a training in Schoology that included uh, all of the parameters. Here's the contract. Here's what you're agreeing to. Here's what you're going to be expected to be turning in. Here's how you're going to share your work with others. Uh, we built these master courses with all of these people and then also taught them how to build what were our expectations for Schoology. And we had check marks along the way. When they finished five or 10 lessons, they put those lessons into a folder in Schoology so that we could check in. And we went back with a rubric that was based on the, the Quality Matters organization. We went back and used that rubric to approve all of those lessons before the master courses were then shared out with the educators who would be teaching those courses. So the next step in our process was course design. And the course design was, was done by the instructor for that course. So they were taking the master course, the shells that were built on that consistent frame, and they were then developing that course based on the needs of their students. Just like how we do in brick and mortar, we have our written curriculum, but we adapt that curriculum to the, to the learners that are in front of us. So we weren't buying curriculum. This was Avon Grove curriculum. This was what we had worked on that had gone through our robust curriculum process and was now being digitized. And that now was being personalized by the teacher who, who was teaching this to those students. And that was something that we really felt, you know, from the beginning had to be a hallmark. And to make sure that our administrators were ready to facilitate that, they were ready to supervise that process. Um, they first went through an online instructional strategies course uh, that, that we, we all took. We went through that together and then they became the administrators of that same course in Schoology. We made several copies of that course. We made one for each building. And then our principals facilitated that course with our students. These are the modules for that course. We partnered with the Chester County Intermediate Unit. Uh, they had created a course with many of these modules. Um, some of us uh, jumped into their course a little earlier in the summer. And then uh, we partnered with them and contracted with them to use some of their materials combined with some of our materials to create a, a professional learning course that was going to be specific for Avangrove. We started with the first six modules you see here. And then as we prepared for our students uh, returning back on campus for a hybrid educational model, we added the seventh model there. So this provided that consistent uh, professional learning across the board. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the digital tools we use. Uh, we know that Schoology is, is familiar to, to the state of Delaware, so that's great. I did see a comment in the in the chat about talking points, uh, which is wonderful. We've used the free version of this very successfully and have, have really um, benefited from connecting with our families using that. Our online learning programs, uh, this is uh, Respondus is the lockdown browser. We talked about assessment a little bit a little bit before. Just some technical results that we were able to achieve. Uh, we, we had many of our students who already had Chromebooks. We did have them keep them. We did not collect them at the end of the last school year, but that still meant we had to uh, ready and distribute about 3,600 additional Chromebooks. And we did that with, it was an absolute all hands on deck um, in the spring. We did a lot of night and weekend distributions, which were mostly our, our central office and a lot of my colleagues on here jumping in and supporting our tech team with that. We have over 350 hotspots in service right now to try to bridge that digital divide. And we're working on, on plans with within our entire region for how we can really uh, decrease that digital divide as we just know online learning will continue in some in some respects 
hundred support tickets a week uh, pretty easily. We had those in English and Spanish. We set up a Spanish only support line um, for uh, tech technology issues in addition to a, a Spanish only text line where families could, could message us uh, all hours. Um, we did some work on our, on our firewall. We increased our, our bandwidth to our internet about 80% uh, through all of this. We doubled access uh, internally in our local area network. We upgraded a lot of switches. We, we used some of the, the grant money to be able to do that, to, to ready our, our network. Um, and actually just, just last night, uh, our, our custom Avangrove School District app, which is gonna be another tool for us to com connect with our families. Uh, this just went live in the Apple Store and the Google Play Store last night. So we're excited to, to use that as well. And part of that, we implemented Safe Arrival, which is an app that is embedded in our custom app where parents can uh, use a variety of tools to report their student attendance online. When it came time to uh, return to school and return to face-to-face, to -face, we continued to uh, provide our parents with and our families and our caregivers with as much information as possible. And you'll see linked here two guides, one guide to our hybrid educational model, one guide to our remote learning model. We put these out in advance of families having to make decisions about what learning preference they were going to choose. So we tried to spell out and answer as many questions as possible. Um, we did focus groups that Dr. Marchese and Dr. Snopkowski uh, facilitated. We had smaller focus groups with, with other colleagues and community members to try to answer as many questions as possible before families made those transitions. And then once we were well into our online academy, we went back to that, that survey again. And we wanted to make sure that uh, we were hitting the mark. Um, you know, we knew that uh, obviously we could see the writing on the wall that the, the pandemic was going to continue for some time. At this point in, sep in September, you know, we knew there was not going to be a, a quick fix here. And uh, this was something that you know, we're just really excited to share because you can see the increases in there. Uh, this is our, our parents and our caregivers and our, some of our older students giving feedback on the improvements in these areas and the schedules, the technology skills, uh, the, the work became more meaningful, that just the jump in the, the live instruction being embedded and building those connections and regular interactions. These were all things that we really saw improvement on uh, based on everything that, that we did or that our team did and that, that our teachers who were just, you know, nothing but amazing uh, we're doing in the classrooms to make all of this happen. So that's a lot of information there. Um, the, some of our areas uh, we did place under the four drivers here for your reference. And as we did with the other groups, I'll stop to share for a moment there and see if we have any questions. So I'll ask another question then. So, so where, where are you still facing your greatest challenges as everything seems to be very well organized, you have a plan, your professional development, where, where are you still finding that, that you know, you're experiencing challenges and problems and, and how are you dealing with those? I mean, I think I think that the challenge that's in front of us right now is that parents and parents are kind of at the wall and they, they want to get back to a normal setting. And I think that that's the biggest challenge right now is to keep, keep people focused on the current situation and keeping them engaged in the current situation while we continue to plan for the next phase, whatever that may be. Um, you know, obviously a lot of our attention has shifted to our struggling learners. You know, there's lots and lots of uh, articles out there, research about how the pandemic's affected student learning. And that's something where we've kind of focused our efforts in terms of kind of really diving into the data to make sure that we have structures in place. And I also think what we're also doing right now too is planning and preparing for when we do come into a, a, a different phase of face-to-face -face learning, what do we need in place to fill the gaps that were created over the last year? 
And what's the best way to facilitate that, whether that be through extended summer school programs, targeted ESL summer school programs, uh, an extended ESY program for special education students, um, whether it be bridges courses in our secondary schools, gap courses in our uh, or gap services in our elementary schools. Those are the things that we're analyzing right now. Those are the areas that we are probably going to focus our CARES money on uh, as we make decisions on how to utilize those, um, those resources so that we can recoup as much as we can uh, what was lost um, so, so that we can kind of pick up back up where we were in, you know, in March of 2020. So. How do you, how do you, or what have you found to be the most effective way of communicating your plans with, with your community and with your parents? So I have, um, I have done um, more regularly a, a weekly newsletter to families. Um, as we've kind of gotten into a system that's kind of scaled back, um, I'm actually sending one out today because we're shifting from state level guidance to determine closures to county level guidance. So just to reiterate um, and make sure that everybody's centered around the, the strategies and the mitigation strategies that we're using. We have a lot of information on, on our website. Um, regularly, we were posting, uh, we were providing uh, communication on a weekly basis. And then um, three times a month during our full uh, board meeting. So when the board's together, either as a committee of the whole or uh, as, as a, uh, together for legislative action meeting, I do an update, a COVID update to the community, which primarily just provides what's, what's changed since the last time I gave the presentation, what do the county metrics look like, what do the local metrics look like, uh, what, what if any decisions need to be made or are upcoming uh, that, are, that are in the forefront. Now we've shared, we've, we've been, we're part of a, 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 an assurance testing plan uh, here in the Southeastern region. So, you know, regularly updating our community as to, you know, what's involved in, in the assurance testing, what populations uh, of staff are gonna be, you know, uh, being able to access that. Just all of the things that, that we learn as superintendents in our meetings with our county meetings, just trying to kind of reiterate that, not, not just to our community, but but our faculty, I, I met with our faculties K through 12 this week to talk to them about the shifting of the guidance, you know, just so that all the stakeholders are all connected and understand, um, you know, we're all kind of learning together. I might be one step ahead of everybody else, but, you know, to me, consistency and um, frequent consistent communication has been the strategy that I've used that I feel has been effective. Now my, my last question was going to be, how have you gotten staff buy-in and, and how has, how has that taken place as you've moved and progressed through the year? Yes, yeah, so we were meeting regularly with the Teachers Association uh, throughout the summer on a weekly basis, um, just so that they were um, lockstep with the administrative team on, on the internal planning and understood all the, all the uh, ingredients of what we were doing and how it would affect the, the labor force, so to speak. Uh, and I feel like just having that constant conversation with the association leadership and then coming out to all the faculties and you know i typically send that the, the 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 big changes those messages come from me it's better to come from one person as opposed to me telling the principals go communicate this to your to your faculties they hear it from me i feel like i've built um very strong trust in terms of how we're going to navigate this pathway with our faculty and staff and and i think that because we have such a good relationship with our association um they help kind of support that process to keep everybody together. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so at this time, we're going to transition into the, the last aspect of our time together. Um, and we are a little bit over on our schedule, so we'll, we'll do this very quickly. Um, the post-pandemic is what
I think we lost Dr. Snopkowski, so I'd be happy to take over. Um, I'm going to try to put myself in his brain and get us through this next part. We work together so closely, it shouldn't be too hard. Um, so for our story post-pandemic, that last conversation was the perfect segue. Um, that's where we are. Where do we go from here? Um, we're going to take a look at a position paper that we sent out. But for years in education, we've been using buzz, buzzwords like transforming education, moving from an industrial factory model to a 21st century model of education. So the challenge before us now is do we actually build on what we learned during the pandemic to truly move past where we've ever been? Or do we revert back to the status quo because it might be easier? and it might be more comfortable for us. So as far as Avon Grove's plan for this, we've been participating in local sessions with other districts where we're engaging in this dialogue and doing some shared problem solving together, kind of like a study council format. Our local intermediate unit, the Chester County Intermediate Unit, recently held a powering up post-pandemic summit where we started talking about all of the possibilities to reimagine the future of education. And as uh, has been mentioned earlier, we are re-engaging Avangrove in our strategic planning process, which will use the coherence framework for us to set new goals for how we are going to reimagine the future in Avangrove. Next slide, Dr. Koch. So uh, in the position paper that we sent out, which is appropriately titled Education Reimagined, the Future of Learning, um, again, Fullen and Quinn authored this position paper. Um, they offer three phases. Disruption was the pre-pandemic survival mode um, during the pandemic when it first started in the spring. Transition was reopening schools in the fall in whatever way that looked. For us, reopening was 100% online. We've heard from some of you that it was 100% in person. Um, so phase two was all about reopening in the best way that we could. Um, now phase three is about reimagining learning. Where do we go from here for the future of education? So we'd like to give you some time in your teams to begin thinking about where you go from here. On page five in your guided notes, you'll see an activity. We're gonna ask that you spend probably a good 20 to 30 minutes on this activity, um, answering some questions from the position paper. So hopefully you had a chance to skim and scan that ahead of time. If not, don't worry. We're gonna focus on pages 14 through 22. Uh, take a look at that and then begin talking about um, what have we learned from this? What knowledge, skills, and attributes do our students need to thrive in this complex world? What kind of learning is needed for the current and future complexity of all of this? How do we ensure equity? How do we attend to well being? What have we learned from remote learning? And how can technology continue to be leveraged for learning in the future? Um, on step four in your guided notes is a link to a Padlet where we would love for each district to provide a summary of your conversation. And that way, as a study council, you can begin to see what everyone is thinking. And hopefully that conversation can continue into your future study council sessions. So we are gonna put you back into breakout rooms, allow you some time to reflect on what you heard from us, where you're going in the future, and then we'll come back together um, at around, I'd say, 11, 11.35 to um, debrief before we close our session. So I'd like to pause for any questions before we head to the breakout rooms. Okay, Dr. Hudson, you can open up the breakout rooms. I'm making of them for 20 minutes, is that fine? Yeah, that, that's great, yep. Okay, thank you. That amount of time. Good luck, team. Oh.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. We hope you found the time working with your teams to be a good start, um, or perhaps you're already there, but a good continuation of conversation about reimagining the, the future of learning. Uh, here's the Padlet. We see some great things on here. Um, it's interesting how different districts focused on different things. So we see SEL, we see remote learning, um, we see growth opportunities. Um, hopefully this can continue in your future study council sessions, this conversation. Um, we'd love to learn from all of you along the way as well um, in terms of where we all go from here. So Dr. Koch, if you can just uh, bring up our closing slide, that would be great. So we just have a few closing thoughts to leave all of you with today. Um, one quote, both of these quotes are from the position paper. Um, the pivotal question is whether seizing the opportunity to create a whole new powerful learning system is more appealing than slipping back into a status quo that does not work. Um, as I mentioned, we've been talking about transforming education for decades. Hopefully now is the time to actually do that long-term and in a sustainable way. And then the last quote here is the interwoven learning, well-being and equity agenda and the corresponding system changes that will be required to enact it is about the future of humanity itself. And I think as educators, we can all embrace that. I don't know about you all, but my inbox is flooded every day with equity workshops, with equity professional development on a local level and national level. This really is an opportunity for us to capitalize on the future of learning in a way that is more equitable and really for the good of humanity overall, the future well being of our society. I would re be remiss if I didn't end our session today just thanking the Avangrove team myself. Um, our success was absolutely in part, um, if not all, because of teamwork. I believe it, at one time the, the phrase dream team was put out there uh, in a board meeting and then we kind of coined that into the dream quarantine. Um, and that's what led us through it. We were there for each other. We supported each other. We pushed back when necessary. And we wish your teams the best of luck and the most coherence possible as you develop the future of education in your districts. So thank you for your time and I'll now turn it over to Mark. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, and one final thank you to, uh, to Dr. Marche Marchese and his entire team and you for all of the work that you've put into this. This was a very important uh, presentation today because this was, of course, our launch. This was our first study council. We really wanted um, to provide important information in a timely manner to superintendents and other district leaders that is valuable and can be utilized. Um, so some of the participants today who are not superintendents haven't heard me say this, I, and I wanna share it with all of you because I, I suspect um, looking through the grid and seeing who's participating, we may see you in future sessions. And the idea of this study council is rather simple and straightforward. And that is when you walk away after a session, you should be saying to yourselves and one another that this is really important, that you have an opportunity um, to have access to information, um, skill development, and so on, that, that really benefits you as a leader as well as your district. Uh, it's also an opportunity for all of you to connect a little bit differently than, than you currently do in your other meetings. I think having a network where you can dialogue and discuss things and share ideas in a safe place is really important. So um, that is the way we are uh, approaching this study council. And we, we appear to be off to a very strong start. March, Friday, March 26th is our next study council meeting. Dr. Roderick Carey, many of you know Rod. He is going to be the presenter and he is going to be a addressing equity and social justice. I'm actually meeting with Rod next Monday to have yet another conversation about what that presentation will look like, the content, uh, the conversations that are gonna be had. Many of us have participated in PD, uh, in, in virtual sessions, podcasts, et cetera, that have to do with social justice and equity. Many of you, if not all of you are currently doing equity work, 
So we wanna make sure that Rod's presentation builds upon the work that all of you are doing. And on a final point, we also have to recognize as we plan these sessions that every district is a little bit different. You're not all the same. So using today's presentation as an example, some of you have communities that really support virtual teaching and the future of it, and some perhaps not so much. So you have to take all of the information that you're receiving, put it into the right context and determine as the leaders of your districts, how to best utilize it. Um, if anyone wants to follow up at any point with Nikki and or her team and have a more uh, detailed conversation or just has some questions about the way in which they've moved forward with all of this work, just send me an email and I'll make that connection. Um, and that concludes our session for today. Wish everyone a wonderful weekend and we will see you in March. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.